Hello, uh, my name is Robert Barnes. I cover the Supreme Court for the Washington Post. Uh, thanks for coming on this crisp fall day uh, to hear about the Supreme Court. Uh, I'd like to thank the Federal Society, particular the faculty division and practice groups for putting together what we think will be uh, an interesting uh, panel on what looks to be a very interesting term uh, at the Supreme Court. You know, after the trauma of last fall's confirmation hearings, there's uh, been a thought that those, uh, from those who watched the court that it went out of its way not to look partisan uh, last term, to look for ways to bust up the ideological divide on the court in some cases, and to slow walk some controversies uh, to keep them off that year's docket. Um, it's been well documented that each of the conservative justices at least once joined the four liberals to make up a majority in a case, uh, and it went the other way too. Each of the liberals at least once abandoned his or her usual voting partners and joined the conservatives in a case. Uh, harmony could be harder to find this year. Here's a look at the docket so far. Whether gay or transgender workers are protected under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, whether the Trump administration act illegally in moving to end the DACA program initiated by President Obama, the court's first Second Amendment case in a decade, the president's power over appointments, a case about a Montana tax credit program that was shut down rather than be expended, extended to cover religious schools. An abortion case is almost sure to be added. There's a chance Obamacare might return. Oh, and you might have heard that the Chief Justice might need to moonlight uh, this term and preside over an impeachment trial in the Senate. Even if it, that doesn't come to pass, those of us who cover and watch the court will be locked in on John Roberts once again, who is the first Chief Justice in decades, who is also the median justice on the court. We saw how he operated a little bit uh, last term in the two most important cases. He, uh, we saw how he used his power. He sided with fellow conservatives to say that the federal courts have no role in, pl in policing state electoral maps for excessive partisan gerrymandering. And then he voted with liberal justices to stop Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross's plan to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census saying the reasons he gave were not believable. We'll try to explore all of this with the distinguished panel of experts we have up here, and we'll take your questions as well, so be thinking. Uh, I'm gonna give short introductions to them so as not to use up uh, much of our time. Uh, if you wanna know more, as I heard Chief, as I heard Justice uh, Clarence Thomas once say to a House panel that asked him a question he didn't particularly wanna answer, Google it. <laughs> so uh, Robert Cottrell is the Harold Paul Green Research Professor of Law and Professor of Histor History and Sociology at the George Washington University. As well as specializing in American legal history, Professor Cottrell has also taught torts and criminal law. He's an expert on the Second Amendment, as you will shortly hear. Josh Blackman is Associate Professor of Law at South Texas College of Law in Houston. He specializes in constitutional law, the Supreme Court, and the intersections of law and technology. Josh is the author of three books, Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, <laughs> Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power, and I forget the name of the other one. <laughs> He also writes at joshblackman.com and he usually writes more about the court than those of us who are paid to write about it uh, to make our living. Uh, Kerry Severino is Chief Counsel and Policy Director of the Judicial Crisis Network and co-author with Molly Hemingway of the best-selling book. I didn't bring copy, just oh my on trial. <laughs> okay, I didn't, I'll I didn't say know it was product placement day. So. I'll say it then. <laughs> Justice on Trial, the Kavanaugh Confirmation and the Future of the Supreme Court. She clerked at the Supreme Court for Justice Thomas. Megan Brown is a partner at Wiley-Rhine. 
where she handles administrative law and regulatory issues. She represents companies and associations, including the U.S. Chamber on preemption and First Amendment issues. Her pro bono practice focuses on amicus briefs and the First Amendment. And Amy Howe is the co-founder of SCOTUS Blog, that indispensable website uh, for all of us who care about the court. She is a, uh, a reporter for her own blog, amyhow.com, and SCOTUS blog. Uh, and although she's too modest to mention it, she's the only person I know of in the Supreme Court press room who has argued two cases there. So uh, as you can see, we have a real panel of experts. Uh, they're going to break down some of the issues uh, that uh, are before the court. Um, and we're going to start with Bob, who'll talk to us about the Second Amendment case. Uh, yes, the court has before it uh, what is actually the first meaningful Second Amendment case uh, that it's been asked to consider uh, since McDonald, uh, which incorporated uh, the right to bear arms against the state. Um, the court did consider in 2016, uh, the, uh, uh, briefly considered and by a per curiam vote, uh, reversed the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court uh, in the case of Caetano, uh, which uh, dealt with uh, whether or not stun guns, electric guns, might be protected uh, under the Second Amendment. But the case that the court is looking at right now is New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus City of New York. And there are several uh, important issues here. One, uh, the court in Heller and McDonald did not set a standard of review for Second Amendment cases. Uh, it simply pronounced the fact that the Second Amendment was indeed an individual right, and in McDonald uh, that it applied to, the, uh, applied to the states through the 14th Amendment. Um, since then, I think many observers uh, have looked at what has happened in the lower federal courts and how they've applied Heller uh, and McDonald uh, and have felt that many of the uh, lower federal courts have basically been using a rational basis lens uh, in terms of, uh, of judging Second Amendment cases, even though they've been calling it uh, intermediate scrutiny. Uh, there, are, there are four justices, I believe, uh, Justice Thomas's, uh, uh, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh, uh, who from their writings and their discussions in court and, and uh, in the lower courts, uh, seem to favor a fairly strong reading uh, of the Second Amendment. And I think one might very well add uh, Roberts to that list uh, as well. Uh, so we have the case of New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus City of New York, and let me just give a little background. Uh, New York State has a highly restrictive pistol licensing scheme. First of all, New York City has two uh, types of licenses. Uh, one is a carry permit, a permit to carry uh, a, a firearm, a pistol, for self-defense. These are highly restrictive. And basically, one can only get them if one has large sums of money <laughs> or if one is rich and famous. Uh, Donald Trump, as a citizen in New York, uh, had a, uh, a carry permit, as do, do a lot of other notables uh, in the city. But ordinary citizens, aside from people who are professional security guards, uh, find it impossible to get such. Uh, the other type of permit is somewhat more permissive, called a premises permit. Uh, Basically, the city exacts a very high cost to, for you to uh, uh, allow you to own a pistol uh, for protection in your own home. It's, the fees run something around in, on the order of about $700, and usually it takes several months wait uh, before one is approved. But at the end of the day, a citizen can, in fact, get uh, a premises permit, though every effort is made uh, to discourage that. Uh, the nub of this case, is that uh, traditionally or, or previously, New York City prohibited um, people who had uh, pistol permits, uh, that is the premises permit, even though they had gone through a long screening process of taking their uh, permitted pistols outside of the city 
uh, either uh, for practice on ranges outside the city uh, or for defense uh, in second homes that they might have. Uh, suit was brought uh, under the Second Amendment uh, on the theory that uh, this was, in fact, a violation of, uh, of the Second Amendment as outlined in Heller and McDonald. Uh, it was brought before the uh, Federal District Court for the Southern District of New York, uh, which sustained uh, the ordinance, uh, and the Second Circuit uh, as well. Um, the Second Circuit's uh, reasoning seemed to indicate that almost any claim on the part of the government uh, as to an interest would be sufficient to cause the city to, in fact, uh, sustain or rather the court to in fact sustain such an ordinance. So for example, even though we're talking about people who again were highly screened and screened over a very long period of time, uh, the city asserted it as an interest without very much in the way of evidence. Well, perhaps they might misuse their guns on the way to their second home or a range outside the city. Uh, or they might get into a road rage uh, situation and bring out their guns. Well, they're not doing it, it within the city. Why are they going to be uh, particularly worse uh, once they get outside? Though having driven in New York, it's, that's not totally uh, beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, in any event, well, the Second Circuit upheld uh, the ordinance. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court granted cert on this case in, uh, on January 22nd of this year, uh, 2019. Um, what the other interesting issue, though, that this case is raising is that uh, New York City and New York State have made uh, strenuous efforts, uh, in fact, to moot uh, this case because they don't want it to get to the court, that fearing uh, what, in fact, the court might do. So, uh, New York City uh, altered its ruling, uh, changed its ruling with respect to uh, taking uh, uh, one's permitted uh, pistols out of town, and New York State uh, uh, legislator um, uh, basically ratified that and set it in concrete by saying that the city could not go back uh, on that. So one of the questions, aside from the uh, Second Amendment question that this raises, is uh, are the issues now moot, and is there still something for the court uh, to consider? Um, uh, those who want the case to go forward uh, argue, of course, that this is always, uh, the actions of New York State and New York City uh, are always reversible uh, at some second, uh, uh, subsequent point. Uh, and also that the Second uh, Circuit opinion is still the law of the Second Circuit and needs to be addressed uh, by the Supreme Court uh, as to whether or not it's consistent uh, with Heller uh, and McDonald. Uh, but there is still the question of is there now a case in controversy as uh, New York City residents with the pistol permits can uh, travel uh, uh, outside of town. Uh, this is an interesting case that has attracted uh, amicus briefs by some 45 uh, different parties, uh, on obviously on all sides uh, of the gun uh, control issue. Uh, the Solicitor General has filed a brief uh, in support of the petitioners, that is New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. A uh, number of briefs have been filed arguing that this is now moot. Uh, there was the brief of uh, Senators uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, Marie Hiro, uh, Hirono, Richard Blumenthal, Richard Durbin, and Chris, Kirsten Gillibrand uh, in support of the respondents, that is New York City, uh, arguing uh, for mootness, but arguing in a very uh, peculiar and I'm not at all sure persuasive kind of way. Basically, uh, uh, you know, telling the court, if you don't rule our way, we're coming after you. Uh, uh, that may, you know, cause, who knows, maybe even the notorious RBG will sort of look at that and say, you don't threaten my court, but uh, uh, in any event. Um, so, uh, so, right yesterday, the court had a session uh, uh, in chambers uh, to uh, resolve the mootness issue, and they have not publicly announced uh, their, uh, their ruling on that, though presumably we'll get a decision on Friday. Uh, if this case is uh, considered to be moot, and my 
prediction is that the court will not take that view, but if, if they do, the next likely Second Amendment case to come before the court uh, is George Young versus State of Hawaii. Uh, the State of Hawaii has a prohibition on the carrying of uh, pistols outside of the home uh, and does not uh, grant uh, 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 permits for uh, carrying for self-defense. Uh, the district court uh, sustained uh, this law against the Second Amendment challenge, uh, but the Ninth Circuit in a three-judge panel uh, reversed, uh, basically saying that the Second Amendment does in fact encompass a right to carry as well as a right to, uh, to possess. Um, the, uh, the, third, uh, the Ninth Circuit, sorry, sorry uh, was uh, looking at that uh, and going to uh, do an on-bank review of, uh, uh, of, what the of the panel determination, uh, but they have suspended that uh, first to see uh, what indeed happens in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, uh, which may address the question of to what extent does the Second Amendment extend uh, uh, beyond the home. So that's sort of where we are at this point. Great, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Uh, the Wall Street Journal editorial board memorably, memorably called uh, Senator Whitehouse's uh, brief an enemy of the court brief. Uh, <laughs> and, and then uh, the Republican senators weighed in with a letter saying, don't pay attention to them. So this is really, uh, you know, John Roberts's favorite thing is to have Democrats and Republicans arguing about the court. When so. does Roberts add the stripes to his sleeve? When does <laughs> yeah, that happen? We'll get, we're gonna get to that, Josh. Uh, uh, Josh uh, Blackman is going to uh, take us through a couple of cases. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and to Bob and, and Bob and all my friends in this panel. Uh, I have two cases, second DACA, first Ramos versus Louisiana. The first case presents the question of whether the Sixth Amendment requires a unanimous jury to convict. Louisiana and Oregon ha have a different law. For certain types of cases, you can convict with 10 members, that is two votes to acquit. Um, Louisiana has subsequently repealed that law, so this case only concerns retroactive claims. This case focuses on an issue known as incorporation. As originally designed, the first eight amendments only restricted federal power. After the 14th Amendment, that calculus changed. Uh, over the course of the 20th century, the Supreme Court said that certain rights are so-called fundamental rights. And as fundamental rights, the states cannot deprive people of those rights, such would be a violation of the Due Process Clause. Um, virtually the entirety of the Bill of Rights has been incorporated. Uh, the Second Amendment was only incorporated about a decade ago in McDonald v. Chicago. One of the few outliers is the right to unanimous jury verdict. Now you may ask, wait a minute, Josh, I have my constitution here. I've read the Sixth Amendment. It says you have a right to a speedy trial an impartial jury, the, the, the trial must be in the place where the crime was committed. It says nothing about a unanimous jury verdict, and you're right. Um, this is what makes this case actually think a little bit more difficult. Last term, we had a case called Tims versus Indiana, which asked whether the excessive fines clause was incorporated. All the justices agreed. They disagreed on perhaps the rationale. Justice Thomas prefers privileges or immunities. I think he's right. Uh, the majority would prefer due process, but they all agree on the same front. This case is different. Because there is no express enumerated right to unanimous jury verdict, I don't know this one's 9-0. I think there'll be incorporation for sure, uh, but I think perhaps Justices Thomas, maybe Gorsuch, I don't know, Kavanaugh, maybe also, we'll see, might be a little bit hesitant about incorporating an unenumerated right because that bleeds into our favorite topic, our boogeyman, substantive due process. Um, so I encourage you to read a brief by uh, the de facto Republican Attorney General, Will Consovoy, who's basically <laughs> working for, uh, I say it with all the love, but he basically wrote the brief for the Attorney General of Louisiana. It's very good. Um, I think it actually shifts my thinking on it. But this is a tough case about incorporation, a lot tougher than Tim's. The second case I'd like to talk about involves our favorite deferred action policy known as DACA. In 2012, after Congress said no to the DREAM Act, President Obama said, yes, I can, and he took an executive action known as DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, this is a policy that I agree with wholeheartedly had Congress enacted. Um, the way it works is like this. Uh, certain minors who are brought here through no fault of their own are given deferred action. 
What's deferred action? It says, we will put you on the back of the line for removal. We will not prioritize you for removal. And we'll also give you something good called lawful presence. Uh, what's lawful presence? It's a status that's not citizenship, it's not amnesty, but it triggers many federal benefits among which you can now work, you get a social security number, uh, and various other sorts of federal benefits. Okay, this policy was in effect for the entirety of the Obama administration, uh, 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 but after President Trump came to office, he decided to repeal the policy, in large part because of Texas threatened to sue him, and they repealed the policy. That's relevant for later. Um, now, you would think that a policy that one president enacts through executive action can be repealed by exactly the same fashion, but no, 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 no. Um, that's not how things work anymore. Uh, district courts across the country held that President Trump could not rescind DACA. Now, the rationale is important. They did not say that DACA must remain in stone, like chiseled, chiseled like the Ten Commandments. Even those were smashed, I don't know. But, you know, the policy can't remain in stone forever. Instead, they said the rationale you've given has been arbitrary and capricious. And indeed, one court said that President Trump's animus towards Hispanics taints the rescission, and that any, re that any attempt to rescind the policy violates the equal protection component of the Fifth Amendment. Okay, now all the lower courts, I think, but one ruled against the Trump administration. The Supreme Court granted review. Um, generally, when the Supreme Court grants review, they grant review to reverse. So the, the good money is that Trump wins this one. Um, I don't know quite how he wins it, and the way, he, the how is actually more important than the what. Uh, perhaps a court holds that this policy, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that the rescission is not subject to review. Maybe they hold that the parties like standing, maybe there's some jurisdictional ground. That would allow the court to uh, let Trump do what he wants to do, but not weigh in on the merits of the policy. Uh, why is it important? The next president, Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris, whoever happens to be, can decide to just reenact DACA from scratch which means we're back exactly where we started from. So my hope is that the court actually decides whether this policy is legal. John Roberts will disappoint me, he does every year. Uh, but maybe he'll have the three stripes, maybe we'll give him some new confidence, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, that's all I have, and uh, I'll turn it over to my good friend Carrie, and we'll hear some of these other cases. Thank you so much. You'll be surprised to learn that the women on this panel volunteered to do more cases than the men. So I'm not gonna take up any more of their time. Go, Carrie, real All fast. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna cover one set of three cases which have to do with interpretation of the phrase because of sex in Title VII and then a couple other criminal law cases as well. Um, so these Title VII cases, I think, are gonna be one of the hot button topics the court is covering this year. And I think it's gonna be an interesting test of how well we can try to separate the incredibly significant social stakes of these issues, um, it, it basically having to do with whether Title VII's protections against sex discrimination also apply to sexual orientation and to transgender status, um, trying to figure out how to uh, separate the court's consideration of whether uh, the, the, that is in the statute in the 1964 Title um, Civil Rights Act versus the very um, hot and current issue of is should this be something that's protected by law. And so the court, of course, is, is a, attempting to look at what the law actually covers right now. And I think it's interesting that this, this as well as one of the uh, criminal cases I'm looking at, really provide a great example of where this court has come in, in embodying in some ways what Justice Kagan said during her confirmation hearing when she said, we are all originalists now, right? E on these topics that I think once upon a time, w with the, in the one case with the death penalty, uh, the insanity defense rather, it, as we'll see in the, on the other case um, with these uh, issues of uh, in major social import, you might have seen more of the arguments focus on, is this a good thing? Is this the just result? How does this impact society? And there is some of that uh, certainly lurking in all of the arguments, but it, particular in this case, you can see both sides are really fighting for the grounds of who has the correct originalist and textualist interpretation of the statute. And I think that's something that is um, very significant and it has to do a lot with the current makeup of the court where we're seeing the ascendancy of uh, the, a textualist and an originalist approach, and I think that's um, the influence of groups like the Federal Society in making this, uh, those kinds of philosophies more well known. Um, it, has, it really has a lot to do with that. So uh, quickly, the first, there's, there's three cases, but they're kind of combined into two different groups in the Title VII. The first group has to do with sexual orientation. There are two cases that are gonna be argued together um, next, right off next week on the 7th. Um, one has to do with Gerald Bostock, who was a child welfare services coordinator in Clayton County, Georgia, and was fired. Uh, there, there were factual disputes as to whether he was 
was fired because of something having to do with an audit or whether he was fired because he had joined a gay softball league and, was, and, and came out as gay or became more salient that he was. Um, but the real question here is whether he can even bring this claim under Title VII. And similarly, uh, Donald Zarda is, is a, was a skydiving instructor uh, in New York. Uh, and he would, as part of his, his job, would have to strap himself to the people who he was training. And oftentimes, if it was a woman, he would try to reassure them that it wasn't anything sexual by, t by telling them, oh, don't worry, I'm gay. Um, and then he had someone who filed a complaint saying, well, I, I don't know whether he was or not, but he touched me inappropriately, and then he ultimately was fired again. The factual question aside of what the real motivation was, um, in this case, the question is, can he even bring this claim? He has uh, unfortunately since passed away in a skydiving accident, but his estate continues it. Uh, in the Georgia case, Bostock lost below because the 11th Circuit precedent, like every other federal circuit until 2017, said the words because of sex in Title VII don't include uh, sexual orientation. In the Second Circuit, uh, Zarda lost initially, but then the Second Circuit took the case back on Bonk and overturned its own precedent. Um, and they said it does. This case has, has excited a lot of amicus interest. There, there are 42 amici on the side of Bostock and Zarda. There are 25 supporting the, the employers. So you know you could say thumb on the scale of amici goes one way, but there is an important 26th amicus in the, on the side of um, the employers in this case, and that is the United States has filed as an amicus. They say we are also employers and have to follow and interpret Title VII, and so they have an, an interest on it. And of course, um, as the Solicitor General is known as the 10th the justice sometimes, that that voice always does weigh heavily. Um, the real question I think that's going to come here is how do you in, what is the, what is the right question as to what because of sex means in the thing? So we, there, we can have no discrimination is because of sex. What is the right comparison to ask whether because of sex is? And you'll have both one one side is saying, well, look, if um, a man were interested in a woman, that would be that would not trigger. Uh, dismissal in this case. If a man were interested in a man, it does. That's a difference because of sex. On the other side, um, you'll have the, the employers in the United States arguing the real distinction is you have a, if you have a homosexual man and a homosexual woman, they're going to be treated the same. And you have a heterosexual man and a heterosexual woman, you're going to be treated the same. So the real thing that's doing the work there isn't whether it's a man or a woman, but, whether, but the homosexual versus heterosexual status there. And so whether which one of those is the correct um, question to be asking, I think, is where all of this turns on. And there's a lot of arguments about both whether inherently because of sex involves um, sexual orientation. There's people, who, there's some arguments being made, well, look, you have to ask, you have to talk about the notion of sex, to even get at what sexual orientation is. Therefore, that sweeps in everything there. I, I think, ultimately, that may be something that the, that the justices find goes a step too far, because there's another um, issue that kind of looms in this case and the next one, which is the idea of there are certain types of sex discrimination or, or distinctions based on sex that are permitted, and in fact, maybe man or su the Supreme Court itself has suggested might be necessary in law, such as allowing for same-sex or separate sex bathrooms, allowing for different dress codes, allowing for different um, fitness requirements. So for example, in the Virginia Military Institute case, Justice Ginsburg suggests that, hey, if you open up the school to women, you might have to now build a new dorm. You might have to have um, different standards here. So there's a suggestion that this is actually potentially required to, op to open the door to more women being involved in things if, if their interpretation is too broad, and I, and I think the risk is that saying anything that touches on sex even then becomes sexual discrimination, it's, it, it risks sweeping in a lot of things I don't think the court's going to want to bring into that. Um, there's this, there's this uh, tension on, uh, in both uh, parties between this, the idea of Congress doesn't hide elephants in mouse holes. They put, said the word because of sex, and I think uh, everyone pretty much agrees that the intent at the time probably wasn't to add sexual orientation or transgender status to the rule, um, to, the, to the law. However, there isn't real legislative history on it. We really have just the text, and I think that's a, it's a great textualist question for that reason. They don't hide elephants and mouse holes, but then there's language that Justice Scalia himself had in a case called Onkali in 1998 saying it, this was about um, male-on-male -male sexual harassment and saying, hey, this might not have been in the minds of Congress at the time, but we have to follow the text even when that might not be what they contemplated. And he said it, it, we have, it often, well, the statutory prohibitions often go beyond the principal evil to cover reasonably comparable evils. 
and it's ultimately the provisions of our laws rather than the concerns of our legislators by which we're governed. So on one side, you have Bostock and Zarda saying, yes, this is part of these evils. It covers a lot more than they expected. On the other side, you have people saying, it, it, either way, Ankali still says it has to be about whether members of one sex are exposed to disadvantages and not the other. So it doesn't go beyond that. So is this the logical conclusion of the text, or is this hiding an elephant in a mouse hole, I think is going to be one of the questions. There's a lot of discussion of sex um, stereotyping. There's a, the, the Price Waterhouse case, which probably many of you are familiar with, that, that brings sex stereotyping in to the because of sex category. Um, I think ultimately that may boil down to the same initial question about what because of sex means because as Price Waterhouse says, um, it's not that it is sex stereotyping information is useful to find out if there has been discrimination based on sex. And the United States is, is certainly uh, strongly arguing it's not a standalone thing. So I think that'll be a question whether the court wants to make it make sex stereotyping a standalone type type somehow of, of uh, um, discrimination based on sex or whether they want to uh, say no, it still all boils down to then what is because of sex in the first place. I think it's also interesting because there's a lot of, there's no legislative history, but there's statutory history, subsequent history, that both sides say means different things. So it's gonna be interesting to watch. Everything from you know watching in, in 1976, the court said pregnancy discrimination was not because of sex. So they apparently weren't going, at least at that point, with the anything that has to do with sex is because of sex. But then the, court, then the Congress went back and added that. So d now the definition includes pregnancy, includes but not limited to. Did that somehow add then sexual orientation in there? There have been repeated bills attempting almost every year since 1975 in the case of um, sexual orientation and since 2007 in the case of transgenderism to add that to the list of things that are protected classes. Um, the fact that those haven't passed, does that suggest that Congress knows how to change it and doesn't? Does it suggest that maybe they think it's already covered? You, sides, both sides make different arguments about that. The Civil Rights Act of 1991 was passed after several circuits had said that sexual orientation and or transgender status wasn't included. Um, does that mean that they're ratifying that information that also was passed after some of these cases that suggest a broader reading of sex, or the, 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 at least some of the parties say, but like Price Waterhouse or Ancali, um, well, Price Waterhouse was after that, but on Kali and a few others, or uh, were before this, they say, well, that that incorporates this broader understanding of what because of sex is, and then the government and the employers, on the other hand, will say, well, they purposely didn't change the language. It says because of sex. They could have added sexual orientation or theoretically transgender status, although that wasn't as much discussed at the time, at that point. So um, that's. Uh, uh, those, I think, are all some of those, the issues that are going to be brought up and going uh, back and forth. I know I'm running low on time, so let me quick. I didn't even get to describe the facts very well in the uh, Harris Funeral Homes case, which is the transgender case, but most of the arguments are very similar. There are some distinctions in this, in this uh, the sexual orientation cases. There's analogies to Loving versus Virginia that get uh, carried out because it, it, it's an argument of is this just a matter of um, an associational harm, the same kind that was in Loving versus Virginia with anti-miscegenation laws. The government basically, I think the, the quickest way to boil down their argument is sex is just different. Race is a, you know, you cannot have, for example, single race bathrooms. You can have single sex bathrooms. You can't have racially restricted dress codes. You could have racially, so there's just a difference between uh, the kind of discriminations we allow on sex versus race. Um, and I think, uh, the other interesting other parallel that happens in the transgender case is the, tra the parallel to religious conversion of can you, could you then analogize this to discrimination on the basis of religious conversion. Um, so that's another kind of wrinkle. Otherwise, I think the arguments are very similar to quickly run through the others because I know I'm short on time. Um, the Collar versus Kansas is the is the an Eighth Amendment case about the insanity defense, and I think is interesting because it does the same thing here, where you've got both sides. Even though the Eighth Amendment is an area that traditionally has brought in a lot of it, uh, involving standards of decency and things, they're talking about on both sides about what's the original understanding. Kansas has modified its its insanity defense to say you don't just have to be unaware of. Um, uh, it, it, you're not insane because you don't know the significance of what you're doing is morally wrong. You're insane only if you don't know that you're even killing someone in the first place, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the uh, caller, the defendant here, is saying that violates my due process under the 14th Amendment and that violates cruel and unusual punishment. And look at the founding. It was really important. And they said that punishing people who were insane would be violative uh, or would be cruel and unusual. So he's making this argument 
On the other side, Kansas is making another originalist argument saying, aha, but insanity meant something different in the 19th century versus the 18th century, and you're using the 19th century version. So I think that's an interesting, um, they're, they're all trying to get at the same, the same uh, thing. And then the final one is just quickly, because I think it's a, a case that, especially for those of us in DC, um, uh, probably hit home a little, and that has to do with a DC sniper who's now one of the snipers who was um, an adult at the time has has already been executed for his crimes, and then uh, Malvo is the was the uh, boy who was 17 at the time. Now, obviously, not a boy anymore, um, but who received life without parole. And there, in initially when he received it, there's a question as to whether it was a mandatory or discretionary life without parole. The Supreme Court has subsequently said if it's mandatory life without parole, um, that's unconstitutional. And then in a later case said, and that's retroactive. So there's a, there's a question, first, whether this even was mandatory or discretionary, but the case, the subsequent case about it being retroactive is unclear as to whether, man, it, it, it's whether it's important, the discretionary or mandatory nature of it. So I think this is an opportunity for the court to just clarify that. It's a pretty finite and, and in the weeds uh, question, but I think it might gain some attention just because of the salience of the DC sniper. Great, thanks so much. Um, I was asked to bet some cleanup on business cases, and from my perspective, the interesting business cases tend to be less about the party A suing party B over intellectual property, although with respect to my IP lawyer friends in the audience, those are fascinating, I'm sure, and there are some really great ones about damages on the docket. Um, but to me, the interesting questions when it comes to business cases at the Supreme Court are the ones that have to do with the rights of businesses against the government, the rights of businesses or how business interacts with the government. And there are a few of those cases that are sort of chugging their way um, to the court. There's several sort of pending and percolating that we can talk about later, but the first one that we also agreed as a group needed to be discussed, even though facially it might seem a little bit um, terribly boring to some people. Once you dig into it, it's really not. It's the um, Puerto Rico financial oversight and management cases, which are uh, fascinating. They're being argued on October 15th. Um, 80 minutes divided up between a bunch of different folks because there are several issues in play arising out of what Congress and President Obama did during the uh, financial crisis that plagued Puerto Rico several years ago. Um, so in terms of background, um, Puerto Rico ran into this economic calamity. They couldn't really use or take advantage of some of the normal tools that an organization would have once it runs out of money. Um, so Congress passed the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, and it created a board that basically acted as a, a, a manager of Puerto Rico's budget and fiscal plans and was given power to modify debts. And I'm not going to get into all the, uh, the gory details of that, but it set up a debt restructuring program that was modeled closely on the U.S. bankruptcy code. Um, interestingly, that oversight board was the only entity with the power to propose a debt adjustment plan, and as you can imagine, lots of people with deep pockets had an interest in what happened to the debts that Puerto Rico had taken on. Um, so that's uh, sort of, you know, you can see where this might end up going, depending on how that board decides to exercise its powers. Um, appointments to this board were made without Senate confirmation. So when the board started to undertake the business of uh, restructuring Puerto Rico's debts, hedge funds and others, including an employees union, uh, challenged, they, they basically said that the uh, appointments are unconstitutional, they violate the separation of powers, they didn't go through the normal Senate advice and consent, um, and they fought the Commonwealth's proposed plan of adjustment. Um, the district court uh, went sort of in, its, in a direction that'll you know, become important later to the government's briefing here. The district court said, the oversight board's a territorial entity. There's really no defect in their appointment. The non-delegation doctrine is not really an issue here. It's fine. Uh, fast forward to the for First Circuit gets the case, and there's four consolidated cases that have been chugging along. Um, lots of the name brand lawyers involved because of the finances at stake. Um, first Circuit disagreed and said that the statute's method of appointment was unconstitutional. So that's sort of the first bucket of issues, right? How does, how does Congress interact with a territory like Puerto Rico and does the separation of powers that would normally obtain um, apply to Puerto Rico? Interesting issue. First issue, main focus of the U.S. government's brief. Um, interestingly, the ACLU is, is uh, very exercised about that particular issue and filed what I found to be a pretty interesting brief arguing for the overruling of what are called the insular cases that um, they say arise out of historical, differential, and racial, racially motivated uh, treatment for the territories uh, of the United States. But putting that aside, very interesting. 
Um, it's what the First Circuit did next that's where a lot of the amici are most interested, and by those amici, I mean the U.S. Chamber and a lot of the business interests who seek to vindicate um, the separation of powers by preventing the government from taking unconstitutional action against um, corporations and businesses. So the First Circuit next said, um, no, we're not going to invalidate the board's past actions, even though it was unconstitutional. Um, and they relied on the de facto officer doctrine, which um, in the chamber's brief is described as dealing with ministerial and technical problems that happen. But boiling it down, it's if you screw up an appointment to someone who's, for someone who's going to make some decisions, you kind of respect the reliance interests of the parties who relied on those decisions, and you don't unravel everything because of some technical problem in the officer's appointment, perhaps. What the First Circuit did here is apply the de facto officer doctrine to the fundamental question of whether the constitution of the board and, and the, all of the um, appointments were unconstitutional, and that's what has got a lot of the amici exercised, uh, because from their perspective, what it sets up is a win in the First Circuit that says, yeah, this was totally unconstitutional, this is really terrible, but we're not gonna undo it, uh, so thanks for bringing this interesting separation of powers case. Um, all the money's gonna stay with whoever the board gave it to. Um, have a nice day. So the amici are in there um, focusing on less the appointments clause. Many amici don't even take a position on whether the appointments clause applies in Puerto Rico, and they fa focus on this de facto officer doctrine with most of them saying this was improperly expanded by the First Circuit. Um, there's some interesting little procedural nuggets going on here. Um, there was, um, you know, notification that uh, President Trump has proposed to nominate new board members, and they're going to go through the Senate confirmation process. Um, so this can feel like a very academic case. For those of you who were super into Noel Canning and these other sort of big separation of powers cases, they're important. They come along every few years. Um, but they sometimes can feel like they lack the real... Um, nuts and bolts, what I liked about a lot of the amicus briefs in this case is they explain why uh, business groups and others would not bring separation of powers cases if they can't actually get meaningful relief. Um, and I thought those were interesting briefs to parse through. Um, uh, it's going to be argued on the 15th. It has a lot of folks that are going to argue. I'm very interested to see how much the court really wants to focus on uh, the appointment -y stuff versus the de facto officer stuff. Um, but I tend to think the court's going to be skeptical of what the First Circuit did on the backside here. Um, because I feel like in the last couple of terms, they have been um, skeptical of a lot of agency action and have been much more willing to sort of put the government to its paces on respecting the separation of powers and, and checking its boxes. That said, there is, uh, you know, a very practical reality that some of these cases feel like, you know, the old Windstar case from a couple decades ago where the financial stakes are quite high and you don't want to necessarily unravel a lot. So I, I think. It'll be interesting to see how the justices approach this. Um, so that's your tutorial on one of the very important but maybe less sexy cases compared to some of the cases that um, my co-panelists have talked about. The one that I would like before we jump into discussion, and I think I'm okay on time, but it's a case um, I know Bob wanted us to focus on actual grants that are pending, but I, there's one where briefing is ongoing that I just, because it was in the vein of sort of business interests as against government. I just wanted to flag as one that I think the court is likely to take up. Personally, I hope they take up, and full disclosure, we filed a brief for the chamber on this case. It's Americans for Prosperity versus Becerra, and, and it's an interesting case about freedom of association for charities, but also, you know, the charities that engage in public policy advocacy. So. Um, near and dear to many of the business associations that are in this room and that play at the court quite a bit. Um, I find the case really interesting because it's in this broader context of the government, certain government enforcement agencies getting pretty creative in how they seek to um, interact charitably put with businesses to extract information from them to understand what they're doing. We saw this in the um, Attorney General's actions against the oil and gas industry through discovery based on RICO theories. These are not your traditional direct um, regulations. There's sort of an end run around um, there. The state of California has some disclosure obligations for charities. and. Um, 
They've started demanding information from these uh, charities, uh, including Americans for Prosperity. They want all their donors and lots of what I consider pretty invasive information about them. And uh, uh, Derek Schaefer at Quinn Emanuel is handling the petition. I thought he did a really nice job in his petition explaining some of the screw-ups that California has made with this information that they have extracted from other charities and really raising the point that we don't want to hand over this information. We have a freedom of association in this country, and what the government's doing here will chill the ability to interact. Um, that has um, tortured uh, procedural back and forth, but it really reminds me of both those AG cases I referenced earlier where you're trying to resist discovery that will have a chilling effect on your associational freedoms. Um, the, the legal question is whether the uh, lesser scrutiny applicable in the electoral context, right, uh, where we require disclosure all the time of, of funding and things should apply outside that context. The interesting thing to me, if they take the case, will be sort of um, Justice Scalia in a case several years ago, I think it's the Washington State case, maybe Reed versus Doe, um, Doe versus Reed, um, had sort of said, listen, the hurly-burly of politics can be really tough. I'm sorry that people are mean and terrible and make death threats for participating in the political process. Um, that sort of comes with the territory. Because this set of disclosure obligations are outside of the electoral context, I think it'll be really interesting to see how this sort of newish court approaches these questions of fundamental freedom of association, um, the, to me, very compelling arguments about the chilling effect on political discourse, um, these associational rights and expressive activities that folks are engaged in, that certain government entities are, to me, quite actively looking to chill with um, some deliberate and thoughtful regulations that are um, designed to get around those normal First Amendment kinds of limitations. So with that, I will pause. I know you want to hear from Amy, and then we can talk about whatever you yeah, guys Molly, want to talk about. Yeah, Molly, what stage is that case at? The Becerra case, uh, the uh, petition is pending. They just filed, and I think the briefing is ongoing. We just, I should say, we just filed our amicus brief. Okay. So I think there'll be a decision. And I, my view, I'm curious what other people think, I think they, there's a good chance of a grant. Amy? Okay. Thank you, Megan. I have to cover the, I'm covering the Puerto Rico cases. I have to write my preview next week. So oh, this was well, really helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am sort of the residual clause of the program. I have three cases to cover. Um, I don't think there's any sort of theme here, but if you, if you can discern one, you can let us know during the question and answer, please. Um, the first case that I'm going to cover is a case called Espinoza versus the Montana Department of Revenue. Um, involving the often thorny issue of government money for religious institutions. In 2015, the Montana legislature enacted a program that created a dollar-for-dollar -dollar tax credit um, that would, could go, the tax credit could go to create scholarship programs. The scholarship programs could then give scholarships to private schools up to $150 in tax credits. Um, the sort of kicker is that in Montana, most private schools are religious schools. And a fun little tidbit is that M Montana Governor Steve Bullock had vetoed several different efforts to create similar programs, but he finally realized that if he vetoed this one, there was going to be a referendum which would bring out a lot of Republican votes uh, at the same time that he was running for governor. So he decided to let this bill become law without his signature. Um, one, only one organization was formed. It was an organization called Big Sky Scholarships, which provided $500 scholarships to approximately 40 families. But shortly after the program was enacted, the Montana Department of Revenue created a rule that said that the scholarship money could not be used to go to religious schools. The Montana Constitution has a, what's known as a Blaine Amendment. It named after the former U.S. Senator from Maine, who in 1875 led an unsuccessful effort to prohibit, to, to create a federal constitutional amendment to prohibit aid to religious schools. So he was unsuccessful in getting a federal constitutional amendment, but there are Blaine amendments around the country, and Montana's constitutional amendment prohibits aid to churches and religious schools. So families that had received this scholarship, these scholarships, and some that wanted to receive the scholarships went to court and said that, yes, uh, that, you know, the Montana Department of Revenue may say that this program would violate the state constitution, but we believe it violates our rights under the federal constitution, specifically the free exercise clause. The case went to the Montana Supreme Court, 
which decided to strike down the entire program. So the families appealed to the US Supreme Court, which agreed to hear the case uh, shortly before their summer recess. So the case has not yet been slated for oral argument, I believe, but will likely be argued in January. So the justices, and as the case comes to the court, the case is operating against the backdrop of two old cases. The first is a case called Locke versus Davies back in 2004. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of a Washington State scholarship program. It was a need-based need program that provided scholarships that students could use at both religious and secular colleges, but the one exception was that it couldn't be used for students who were intended to major in programs that would prepare them for the ministry. So a student who wanted to major in devotional theology challenged the ban on the use of, of funds, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and in an opinion by Chief Justice William Rehnquist, uh, the court said there's no doubt that the state could allow these funds to be used for uh, programs that would prepare students for the ministry. The question is whether or not it, has, uh, it would violate the free exercise clause if the state said it can't be used for these kinds of programs. And th the answer at that time the Supreme Court said is no, the state has simply chosen not to fund religious instruction. So that's the first case back in 2004. The second case is much more recent. Many of you will remember it back in 2017 in a case called Trinity Lutheran Lutheran versus Comer, the Supreme Court by a vote of seven to two uh, agreed that Missouri's policy of excluding churches from a program that provided grants to resurface playgrounds violates the Constitution's free exercise clause. Um, the vote was seven to two with Justices Sotomayor and Ginsburg dissenting, the Supreme Court dropped a tricky little footnote um, from which uh, Gorsuch, that Gorsuch and Thomas declined to join and said, the court is not weighing in on religious uses of funding or other forms of discrimination. Um, so the state's argument in the Supreme Court in, in the Montana case is that the, the Supreme Court has made clear in cases like Locke versus Davey that states can choose not to fund religious groups without violating the Constitution. And by the way, the Montana Supreme Court struck down the whole program so nobody's getting the money anyway. Um, so I think the question as it comes to the court is where sort of what is the Supreme Court going to do? Sort of how is it going to navigate between these two cases. Tr Trinity Lutheran uh, appeared to be a sort of compromise, minimalist decision. Justice Gorsuch had just joined the court. Um, you know, last term in a, in a case challenging the presence of a peace cross on public land uh, outside of Washington, D.C., it was also a, a seven to two decision, and Justice Alito wrote in that case that taking the, the cross down would actually be an act of aggressive hostility towards religion, like allowing, taking it down wouldn't be neutral toward religion, it would actually be aggressively hostile toward religion. So that's, it's a different case, but I think it says something about where the mindset of, of many of the justices is likely to be going into this case. You know, you can see, I think, a, that, the, that there would be a majority of the justices who might be ready to read Locke versus Davey relatively narrowly and say, okay, states can't be required to fund religious training, but you know, it would violate the free exercise clause to, to go to, to, to limit state funding beyond that. Um, I'm gonna be watching, I think, the dynamics on the court in this case. Justices Kagan and Breyer joined the court's opinion in the Trinity Lutheran case. They joined the result in the Bladensburg Cross case. Um, it's, it's a little bit harder to see where the compromise might be uh, in this case, but particularly, I think we'll probably talk a little bit about the dynamics on the court. Uh, the, the likelihood that the Chief Justice might be trying to not have these 5-4 ideologically divided opinions, this might be one where he might see a room, some room to do that. Um, the next case that I want to talk about is a case called Hernandez versus Mesa. If that name sounds familiar, it's because the, it was at the court a couple of years ago. It's a lawsuit by a Mexican family that's seeking to hold a U.S. Border Patrol agent responsible for the shooting death of their 15-year-old son. The son was on the Mexican side of the border when he was shot by the Border Patrol agent who was on the U.S. side of the border. Um, 
the family's argument it, when they filed their lawsuit several years ago was that the Border Patrol agent had used excessive force in violation of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments to the Constitution. They were trying to bring their claim under a 1971 case called Bivens versus Six Unknown Named Agents in which the Supreme Court allowed a lawsuit seeking money damages against federal officials for violating the Constitution to go forward. The district court dismissed the family's claims. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit upheld that dismissal. They went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments back in 2017 and then sent the case back for the Fifth Circuit to look at the case again in light of the Supreme Court's decision the same term in another uh, Bivens-related case called Ziglar versus Abassi. That was a case uh, brought by Middle Eastern men who'd been detained by the government after September 11th. Um, we're trying to uh, sue various government officials. Um, in Ziglar, the, the Supreme Court said that Bivens should not be extended to a new context when there are special factors counseling hesitation. Justice Thomas wrote separately in that case, he would have said that uh, in the Hernandez case, the first time it was at the court, he would have said that the family couldn't rely on Bivens at all. Justice Breyer dissented, he was, was joined by Justice Ginsburg. He would have ruled that, the, that they could have brought a claim under the Fourth Amendment and likely could have brought their case under Bivens. On remand, the Fifth Circuit ruled that Bivens does not apply. They said this is a new context because it's not clear whether the, the Constitution applies to a foreign citizen on foreign soil and that there are the kind of special factors counseling hesitation. They were worried about national security issues, interference with foreign affairs and diplomacy because of the sensitivity involved at the Mexican border. Congress has not provided a damage remedy and there's a presumption that U.S. law does not apply outside of the United States. So the Hernandez family went back to the Supreme Court, asked the justices to take up their, the case again. Last fall, just about this time last year, the Supreme Court asked the U.S. Solicitor General to weigh in. The Solicitor General filed a brief in the spring. Um, in this case, in a, another case involving a cross-border shooting out of the Ninth Circuit, and in that case, the Ninth Circuit had uh, allowed the case to go forward, said that Bivens remedy would, should be available. Because the two lower courts had reached opposite conclusions, the, Supreme, uh, the Solicitor General recommended that the Supreme Court grant review in the Hernandez case, but said that a Bivens remedy shouldn't be available. So the Hernandez family is back. They say this is the exact same context as Bivens, a rogue government agent using excessive force. There are no special factors, uh, despite what the Fifth Circuit and the government says, because it's a rogue agent. There aren't national security issues. There aren't foreign affairs issues. If, if there are foreign affairs issues, they say, it's because the Mexican government, which filed a brief supporting the Hernandez family, is mad that, that, that they don't have any kind of remedy. Um, and then they said, finally, unlike the Ziegler versus Abassi case, we don't have any other remedy if we can't sue these officials in federal court. Um, the court has not extended the Bivens remedy in nearly 40 years. Um, so I, if, if I were a betting person, which, I, which I'm not, uh, I would, would not bet, bet on them extending it again in this case. Um, the third case I'm going to talk about involves a, a, along the lines of what Megan said, the hurly-burly of politics. Um, I don't want to make light of anyone going to prison because it's obviously a very serious thing, but this is, I think, one of the more fun, high-profile cases of the term involving Bridgegate. Um, back, uh, the case called Kelly versus United States. You know, corruption and, and political misconduct may be distasteful to the justices, but does it cross over and become a federal crime? There's been a line of cases in the Supreme Court resisting efforts by federal prosecutors to use the federal criminal statutes to punish political misconduct. And I think that this is likely to be another case in which the justices wind up pushing back. The George Washington Bridge, as many of you are aware, crosses the Hudson River from Fort Lee, New Jersey into the northern um, part of Manhattan. The upper deck has 12 lanes. Um, for many decades at rush hour, three of those lanes have been blocked off with cones for residents of Fort Lee, New Jersey, so that they can merge onto the bridge easily and get over Manhattan to get to work. Um, 
but back in 2013, when Chris Christie was up for re-election, the mayor of Fort Lee, New Jersey, did not want to endorse his re-election bid. Um, so that led Bridget Kelly, who was Christie's deputy chief of staff, and two Port Authority, uh, high-level Port Authority staffers, David Wildstein and William Baroni, to put together a plan to take those three traffic lanes and close them down to one lane to punish the mayor for his failure to endorse Chris Christie. They needed a cover story to do that, so they concocted a fictitious traffic study um, and Gridlock ensued. They did it on the first day of school in September 2013 without any heads up to anyone at the Port Authority or in Fort Lee. Um, there are stories about children sitting in school buses for hours, there are, um, paramedics getting stuck in traffic and having to get out and walk to respond to someone who was having a heart attack. Um, it also cost the F Port Authority approximately $5,000 because they had to pay over time for toll collectors and then pay for the engineers who were conducti conducting the phony traffic study. Um, eventually, the head of the Port Authority figured it out. They went back to the old system. Um, the, then the heads rolled. Uh, Bridget Kelly, David Wildstein, and William Baroni all resigned. Chris Christie, who'd wanted to sort of get all of these endorsements to build momentum for his presidential campaign, uh, was not elected president. Um, Wildstein pleaded guilty to conspiracy, and then Kelly and Baroni were charged with violating federal fraud statutes. Um, the government's theory was that they had deprived the Port Authority of property in the form of the extra salaries for the toll collectors and the engineers, and the fraud came because they had lied about why they were conducting the traffic study. So Kelly and Baroni's argument is that the government is only relying on this theory because it couldn't do this under the actual federal honest services statute because back in 2010, the Supreme Court ruled that you can only rely on the honest services statute if there are actual bribes and kickbacks. And Kelly and Baroni didn't get anything out of this other than the pleasure of knowing that they were getting retribution to the governor of Fort Lee. And they say, if you allow the government to define property for purposes of this fraud statute this broadly, it is gonna sweep in all kinds of political misconduct. You know, when somebody prioritizes one neighborhood over another for snow plowing, because they want to sort of curry favor with that neighborhood, but they say that they're plowing that neighborhood first for safety purposes. That could be, uh, you know, and they send an email about it, that could be swept in under the federal fraud statute. If you have a Secretary of Commerce who lies about why they want to add a question about citizenship to the census, they say that could be swept in under the federal fraud statute. So I think this one is gonna be really uh, interesting to, to keep an eye on. If I were not a completely neutral observer, I might say that yes, screwing around with my commute is a crime, but <laughs> I am, so I won't. Um, as Megan uh, talked about, you know, and most of you know, the Supreme Court's docket is not set when the term begins. They continue to look at cases and accept cases for review through generally about the end of January. And so we're gonna talk quickly about two cases that might, um, be there, one that seems quite likely and then involves uh, a Louisiana abortion law. Uh, last February, the Chief Justice joined the court's liberals to stop, block a Louisiana law passed in 2014 that requires doctors at abortion clinics to have admitting privileges at nearby hospitals. The, uh, that might sound familiar to you because the court in 2016 uh, considered a nearly identical Texas law and struck it down. In that case, Justice Anthony Kennedy joined the court's liberals in a five to three decision. Uh, that 2016 decision said admitting privileges requirement, quote, provides few if any health benefits for women, poses a substantial obstacle to women seeking abortions, and constitutes an undue burden on their constitutional right to do so. Uh, both sides agree hospitalization is rare uh, after an abortion and that the lack of admitting privileges by the doctor who performed the procedure is not a bar to the woman getting medical care if she needs it. Uh, but last fall, the a panel of the F U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit revisited the, the Louisiana law 
and found that there were factual distinctions between how the restriction played out in Texas and Louisiana. Uh, Judge Jerry Smith said, unlike in Texas, the Louisiana law does not impose a substantial burden on a large fraction of women. Uh, so it seems unlikely that the uh, court would issue a stay on a law and not accept the case. Uh, they considered it yesterday at their private uh, conference. We'll likely hear something uh, soon. Uh, and it raises the question about whether the court is ready to revisit a fairly new uh, precedent, uh, like the one in Whole Women's Health, or whether they will distinguish it in a way that a restriction that's not allowed in one state uh, is acceptable in another state. The court has a second case that's been around since last term. It hasn't acted on from Indiana. And it combines a waiting period, which has been ruled okay, with the requirement of an ultrasound, which has been ruled okay, but in sort of separate uh, instances. The change in the Indiana law is that the waiting period follows the ultrasound. Uh, and that would mean basically a two-day uh, process for uh, women who wanted an abortion there. And the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit said that that created a burden on the right to abortion without any discernible benefit. So uh, the court may take one of these cases. It may take both of them and come to uh, different decisions. Uh, about uh, abortion restrictions in those cases. Again, the balancing act that we've sort of talked about. Um, but we should get word fairly soon on if the court is gonna take this up. Um, Josh is going to uh, talk about whether or not we'll see Obamacare uh, return to the court. Uh, he has a bit of a vested interest. It could mean a third book for him, Trilogy. I think. But he's gonna, <laughs> but he will try to be dispassionate. I didn't bring those books here, but I, I, will, I will indulge. Uh, Obamacare is a gift that keeps on giving at the Supreme Court. Uh, you recall in 2012 that Chief Justice Roberts narrowly upheld the ACA. He left it dangling by a thread. He said, because the law's penalty can be read as a tax that raises revenue, we can read the ACA as not actually imposing a mandate, but as a constitutional tax on going uninsured. Basically, the law is dangling by a thread. Fast forward to 2017. Congress enacts the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. That law reduces the penalty to zero dollars. At the time, I said, huh, I guess Obamacare is unconstitutional now. I realized it, and so did Texas. Texas filed a lawsuit arguing that reducing the penalty to zero dollars kills the Chief Justice's saving construction. As a consequence, the individual mandate can no longer be read as a tax, and the mandate's unconstitutional. The million dollar question, of course, is what happens to the rest of the law. Uh, the Fifth Circuit heard argument over the summer. I expect a decision from the Fifth Circuit uh, sometime next month or so, which would give us a cert petition by November, give or take, uh, which means a court could calendar it for an argument in, let's just say, March, uh, to make this term even more uh, insane. Uh, if we have another Obamacare case a couple months before the election, I see Karen Harnett's in the room. Uh, she knows how this one ends. Uh, we all know how this one ends. Uh, I'll have another book to write about in a couple, <laughs> couple months. All right, thank you. Um, so we're gonna uh, have a little discussion, questions. We also want to take your questions. I think there's a microphone uh, if you have one in the middle of the room. Um, so uh, panelists, we have a, an incredible term that you've all laid out for us. So let me ask you a question that has nothing to do with it. Uh, and that is uh, the, what everyone is talking about right now is impeachment. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, partly because my editors are wondering, consider this a reporting <laughs> exercise, um, what exactly does an official impeachment inquiry mean for the courts? Does it, does it give a sense of urgency to some of the cases that are in the lower courts right now? And also, how likely do you think it is that the Supreme Court will have to weigh in at some point if the executive branch continues to ignore uh, requests from the House or subpoenas from the House to provide information. 
Well, I open it up to anyone who would like to. One, th one thing we might get is the three stripes again, as uh, Josh was <laughs> relating, because yes. that's when the Chief Justice added those three stripes. Is he doesn't so seem they, like a three stripes guy uh, to me. He, but took, he took them off, so he probably, <laughs> he probably won't. But it, it, you, you can imagine it could make Chief Justice Roberts' life a little busy if he's got two full-time jobs. Yeah. I can think of no task. I think the Chief wants less yes. than to yeah. have that thrust upon him. So John Roberts will have a motion to dismiss the charges immediately. Actually, this was in the, I think the post yesterday, that if there's actually an impeachment in the House, it moves to the Senate. Speaker, uh, Leader McConnell says, okay, let's have a motion to dismiss the charges right away. And then that will be voted on. And in fact, Harry Byrd, back in the day, had a motion to dismiss the indictment against Clinton. At the time, the GOP controlled the Senate, so that was turned down, so there's at least some precedent here. So if, in fact, the House votes to impeach, I think John Roberts' first job will be to entertain a motion to dismiss the impeachment by a sheer majority vote. I think on sort of the 35,000-foot level, if issues related to the impeachment come to the Supreme Court yeah. and the Supreme Court has to rule on them, I think you know, the fact that they're going to would, would get involved would sort of give even further sort of incentive, at least to John Roberts, to the extent that we believe that he really wants the court to avoid being seen as partisan. I think that that would just add to his desire to avoid being seen as partisan, to avoid, try to avoid these 5-4 decisions in some of these high profile cases. Whether or not he can do that is an entirely different matter. You know, I think, as everybody knows, he's got one vote and all the other eight justices have very strong minds of their own. Well, let me ask you about Roberts, and then we'll get to the questions, because, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about him, talking about him. He does have only one vote, uh, but it's a, an important one. Uh, it seems like that he could use it uh, to keep the court, perhaps, from taking up some cases that uh, some one side or the other might want because they don't know how he would vote or because he tells them how he would vote. Um, it, how do you think he's managing this, uh, this role of trying to protect the institution uh, and yet, uh, you know, carry out his job and rule on cases? I would say the challenge is, um, you know, there's the, the notion of legitimacy. There's their different concept of what makes a court legitimate. And, and there's the idea of legitimacy is, is winning the polling numbers and how, how popular is the court? Do they think the court is good? Or is legitimacy derived from the court being founded in a constitutional system that's ultimately part of our representative government? Um, and I think it, trying to navigate, you know, I'm not sure if you can always uh, hit both of those at the same time. So to the extent that um, you're, that, uh, the Chief Justice, and you know, it's hard to know what to make of some of the reporting of his shifting and votes in, in different cases in Obamacare or, or in uh, the census case. To the extent that he is giving the impression that he is making decisions based on political considerations, which the, the reporting suggests maybe he was in those cases. I think that actually, while it may address the, or, or be an attempt to address the popularity contest part of legitimacy, I think actually in the long run would undermine it both in terms of the public view of the court and in terms of its actual legal legitimacy as an institution. Um, so I, I would hope that that doesn't continue to be, in, you know, the White House brief uh, that, that Bob mentioned too is maybe part of that same prospect. If there's a perception that the court can be bullied um, into changing votes, that's really bad for the institution as a whole. And I, 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 I'm sorry to see that there's five senators who think that's a, a good move to do. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm hopefully hopeful that the other justices don't want to see that because that's bad for the court. I frankly don't see how they saw that as a persuasive brief by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, uh, I don't think that's what but, they were going for. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they were trying to persuade Yeah, it might not have been intended for the court uh, as <laughs> uh -huh. much. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Anyone else I mean, I before think, we move on? Yeah, I mean, I think there are other justices on the court who may be willing to sort of work with him, not sort of in a political sort of let's change votes, but in sort of let's find a middle ground. The problem is I think some of these cases, like the Title VII cases, I'm not sure that there's a middle ground to be had. I mean, I think the answer is yes, Title VII protects LGBT employees, or it doesn't. And, mm -hmm. yeah. so you just yeah. have some and I think that the country has very strong feelings about it. Mm. I'll add just one thing about the court's popularity. I just saw a Gallup poll, yeah. annual poll that uh, they do, uh, and it shows, as always, that if a Republican controls the White House, Republicans think the Supreme Court's doing a good job. And if Democrats control the White House, people, Democrats think that the Supreme Court's doing a good job. 
But an interesting thing that jumped out to me was on independence. Um, asked in 2000 whether the court was about right, too conservative, or too liberal. Independence, 50% of independents in 2000 said about right. 25% said uh, too conservative. 15% said too liberal. Uh, asked again this year, 50% said that the court was about right. 29% said too conservative. 15% said uh, too liberal. And so it's very interesting that while it's gone up and down, uh, independents at least uh, seem fairly happy with the court. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Brooks Harlow. I practice telecommunications law. Yesterday, we got a decision out of the D.C. Circuit, 186 pages. I confess, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> it's on net neutrality, which then turned into restoring Internet freedom, and the court mostly upheld the FCC, um, which uh, the uh, challengers obviously won't like. The uh, court also uh, uh, largely overturned, vacated the decision on uh, FCC's preemption of state efforts to uh, put in net neutrality uh, legislation or rules. So I think there's a good chance it's gonna go up. This may be too deep in the weeds for you. I haven't read it, you may not have read it either, but um, I've already heard some uh, talk from colleagues that, that it may go up and the court may use this case as a vehicle to address Chevron deference. And the reason is the FCC has flip-flop. Over 20 years they have flip-flop about four times on how to break weather and how to regulate the internet. Um, and each time the courts, and it's gone up to the Supreme Court at least twice, we fit most famously in, in the Brand X case, each time the, the Supreme Court has, uh, under Chevron deference, deferred to the agency's determination. You know, how many times will the court do that after all these flip-flops before they say, eh, maybe Chevron deference needs to be looked at. So if you, if you don't know about the case, uh, watch for it. If you, uh, and I would, if, not, if that's the case, I would welcome any general comments on Chevron deference and whether that might be coming up in some other case this year. Yeah, I mean, our practice is mostly in the telecom space, so we've been watching it with some great interest. My former colleague, Brett Shumate, is in the audience, and he filed a brief in that case and argued a piece of it. Um, it was a long, delayed case. I think I'm very curious to see what Tom Johnson at the FCC and the chairman want to do on that latter piece. Um, I, I don't know exactly what I think they should do on the preemption piece of it, but I agree the court's been looking at Chevron. They had um, a couple of cases last term that signaled a willingness to push um, against the typical deference that agencies get. I don't know that this would be the right case if I'm the challengers, that I would want to take this up to the court and use net neutrality and all of its baggage as a way to tee up Chevron. I mean, it was a pretty, to me, the D.C. Circuit um, application of Brand X seemed not all that controversial to something that's, you know, well within the agency's discretion here. I just don't think it's necessarily the best vehicle to, if, you're, if your dream is to get Chevron sort of undermined, I don't know that these challengers are the people that want to carry that water, and I don't know that this would be the vehicle, because if I'm the court, quite frankly, I don't want John Oliver telling people to send nasty notes and camp outside the courthouse, because it's a nasty case, and it's not been well handled by the advocates. Um, so that's my... Very opinionated view, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We're Thank good you. with opinions here. Thank you very much. This question involves conversion therapy, and for those in the room who do not know, that means a gay person would be brainwashed or psychologically analyzed and forced to no longer identify as a gay person. So there's a case from Aspen, Colorado that's moving forward to the federal courts and to the Supreme Court involving a lesbian couple arrested at church. They completed the conversion therapy, were invited back. That day, the police arrested them for third degree criminal trespassing. Um, the case was appealed and continues to be appealed. Uh, the reason being that the habeas corpus petitions filed with the judge have never been docketed. Uh, so the ruling has been uh, one has failed to uh, follow and achieve state remedies. So as we see the sex cases move forward, do you see in the future the docketing of conversion therapy? This, uh, the case at the Second Circuit was a RICO case, a, a racketeering case where the uh, 
winners of the of the recovery did a, did get a treble damages. So, uh, what insights do you have into this kind of subject matter as the future might unfold? Yeah, I, I personally don't know much about the case or about the issue uh, that much, or, or or it being at the court. I mean, I think we all agree that it is. A, disagreement among the lower courts on these issues that most often prompts the Supreme Court to step in uh, on one of these issues. I don't know uh, what that's like in the lower courts. I don't know. Does anyone else have any uh, thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, the um, sort of gay rights cases are uh, there and will continue. There's a case we haven't talked about yet that is sort of the follow-up to the Masterpiece Cake Shop case about whether uh, wedding vendors are required to offer their services to same-sex weddings. Um, that, I think, has a good possibility of returning. Uh, there's a case of involving a florist from the state of Washington that's at the court uh, right now. It seems likely to me uh, that I think it will be, and Amy might know better, I think it it's teed up to be uh, considered by the court in time for this term. Yes, uh, I think so. But anyone else? I just have, uh, I guess, some basic questions on it because I'm, it's an area that I'm totally unfamiliar with. Um, gay conver conversion therapy. Um, an individual who is gay says, I don't want, wish to be gay anymore, and I want to undergo some kind of therapy, one way or the other. Um, who would have legal standing and why to challenge that? In this case, a religious freedom aspect uh, has surfaced. We know now that there are 18 states in America who do not allow conversion therapy and have ruled it unconstitutional in those states. Could so. I ask a question? Even if the individual is an adult and says, I wish to change. I would hope that the government doesn't tell us what to do in our private lives. Well, should they tell this individual who wants to go from gay to straight, you may not do this? Uh, on the reverse side, uh, we believe that gay people are born, and it's not a decision, and that uh, those private rights would lack uh, jurisdiction in the federal courts or in the, okay, the but, secular courts. But with the case that you've raised, an individual says, my religion says being gay is wrong. Okay, you don't have to agree with that religion. He says, my religion says this, I wish to change. Should the state have the ability to come in and say, no, we've decided you were born gay and you must stay gay regardless of your wishes? That's a violation of the First Amendment, and I think it'll be an interesting uh, debate and will happen in American history. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. It's a topic you've already discussed once, the Louisiana abortion case. Mm -hmm. uh, my disclosure is we filed a brief in that on behalf of 2,256 women hurt by abortion and by the abortion industry. So uh, part of the issue is the reason I'm raising the questions is in the coverage of the case, they always talk about being exactly similar to the Texas case. But in the Texas case, there was an ambulatory surgical center requirement and hospital admitting privileges. And the cost of an ambulatory surgical center was about a million dollars to build a new one. So to me, that's why the number of abortion clinics was reduced in Texas when the law went into effect, because unrefuted evidence was a pretty high barrier to entry. Uh, in Louisiana, the facts, in my opinion, are very different. And I think those are just facts. So I was, what I, my point is in the question, the distinctions between Texas need, uh, and Louisiana factually need to be brought out. And then the other thing is the abortion industry thought of Hellerstadt. They call their next litigation strategy the big fix. The attorney general in the Texas case points out, and there's five states where they've sued, aside, they've sued to set aside every abortion facility regulation. They don't want it to have to be done by a doctor 
or to require sterilized instruments, for example. They think all regulation of abortion, it's almost going back to Roe v. Wade, strict scrutiny, fundamental right analysis. And that's one of the reasons uh, Texas and many states filed an amicus brief in the Louisiana case saying this, uh, their interpretation of Hellerstadt, which would lead to the elimination of all regulation, is a very extreme interpretation of Hellerstadt. I'd like your opinions on that. Well, I, I have not followed the case closely enough to say whether that would be the logical conclusion. I, I, I just want to point out that because of those factual distinctions that you point out, it brings up an interesting tension in this case between some of the things that, again, the Chief Justice is apparent interests here of both having narrow decisions and having these broader decisions because they're narrow, but also in not having to bring the court into controversial issues. And this case is kind of an example of how those can be at odds with each other because the way, you know, the, the fact that Whole Women's Health did cite lots of these factual issues involved in the Texas law, the distance that women would have to drive if certain clinics were closed, and the, et, et, et cetera, um, that actually almost invites further litigation because the next case they don't they just have to tweak a few different things or it's naturally going to be different because the size of Louisiana is different than Texas and so you are going to see um, almost it's, it's almost a you know a full employment act for for uh, lawyers on both sides of this it, and this contentious issue and unfortunately guarantees that the Supreme Court isn't going to get away from deciding uh, issues on this topic for a while anyone else I actually have a question Yes. Like What's your question? Okay, I, I have a question for my fellow panelists or for anybody that might be in the group. Uh, looking at the unanimous jury question, it reminds me of a question that I had uh, when McDonald was being argued and, and briefed, which is I saw no, uh, what I would have expected to have seen would have been briefs from the criminal defense bar arguing for total incorporation on the theory that in 2010 it looked like McDonald might very well be the last time the court actually considered the incorporation question and that there were several things that the criminal defense bar would have had an interest in. Uh, unanimous juries, excessive fines, uh, the grand jury, and bail, all of which have either not been incorporated or at least incorporation is somewhat unclear uh, in these cases. So, this is a kind of dog that didn't bark. Why didn't we see massive briefs from the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, ACLU, and other uh, groups saying, look, this is a time to look at incorporation once again and simply do away with selective incorporation and go for total incorporation? So if any of the audience has thoughts on that, they're going to have to tell them afterwards because we're almost out of time. All right. But the panelists can weigh in quickly if there's someone who has thoughts on that. Uh, I, I don't. <laughs> I think sometimes, even, even in these groups that have single issue areas, there's also so many political coalitions that maybe the, you know, the same group might actually love the idea of general incorporation but not love the idea of... Second Amendment being incorporated, so it creates it creates some challenges in terms of how do you how do you have a intellectually consistent you know position anytime there's and I think those coalitions occur probably on both sides of the aisle. And I'm personally for anything that gets more cases that are interesting before the Supreme Court. So um, thank you for your attention and please thank the panelists uh, for their expertise. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.